Welcome to the Commercial Booster Pump Design Webinar. I'm your instructor today. My name is uh, Redmond Hum. Just to give you a quick introduction to myself, uh, I'm the product manager for Armstrong's boosters, heat exchangers, and expansion line of products. I've worked in uh, the HVAC and plumbing engineering field for over 10 years, focusing on product development, uh, energy efficiency and sustainability, and system optimization. I've also been involved in numerous HRI committees where I actively drive improvements in industry standards and testing procedures related to HVAC products. Uh, I hold a master's degree in mechanical engineering uh, with a specialization in design and management. So buildings decorate the landscape of major cities around the world. Every building requires clean, safe water, for basic human activities such as drinking, cooking, washing dishes, or showering. As buildings started getting taller and taller, uh, the utility is not able to supply enough water to the upper levels of the building. Uh, the role of the booster system is to increase the pressure of the water supplied by the utility if not adequate to supply the upper levels of the building. In a study compiled by the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the number of commercial buildings has increased from 3.8 million in 1979 to 5.6 million in 2012. The growing population has also led to increased number of high-rise buildings in major cities. So as the number of buildings grow, there's an increasing need and demand for boosters to meet building requirements. So our challenge today is to learn how to determine the best booster package to satisfy the building load. To accurately size a booster, we need to first determine the building requirements. Then we need to determine the booster requirements. And we can size our booster accordingly afterwards. Today we're first going to go through determining the building requirements. Then we're going to look at the anatomy and capabilities of a modern booster package. Uh, we will then learn how to select the booster um, and go through special considerations of drawdown tanks, part loading, ASH rate 90.1, uh, NSF standards, and other important considerations. So what do we need to size a booster? In order to size a booster, like most plumbing systems, uh, there are three important parameters, and that is flow, head, and suction pressure. As it applies to buildings, first we need to determine the total flow that the building requires. We need to determine how much pressure is required from the booster pumps, also known as the boost pressure. And we also need to find out how much pressure is coming from the city or tank into the, into the booster pumps. This is known as the suction pressure. So a picture of building. Uh, what things use water? The first thing that comes to mind are toilets, uh, faucets to wash your hands, uh, a shower, maybe drinking fountains. And these are a part of a group called water fixtures. And they all contribute to the total water flow requirement of the building. To calculate the required flow, there are four things that we need to determine. First, we need to get an inventory of the total number of water fixtures in the building. Then we need to know what each fixture is. Is it a toilet? Is it a faucet? Is it a valve? Etc. And then we need to do, determine what type of building we're designing for. Is it a res residential building, public building, heavy use building, restaurants, for example? And lastly, we need to determine what if there's any special services. Now, knowing the number of fixtures and the type of fixtures 
One might be inclined to add up the required flow for each individual water fixture and total them up. This would lead to oversizing of the flow requirements. Research and testing, we found that it's possible to determine the flow requirements from knowing the number of fixture units and the type of building that we're designing for. If you look closely at the graph, you'll notice that the total flow in general increases with the number of fixtures. You will also notice that the total flow required depends greatly on the building type. Curve A shows the flow requirement for restaurants. Curve B shows the flow requirements for uh, hospitals, nursing homes, nurse residences, dormitories, hotels, and motels. Curve C shows the flow requirements for apartments, houses, and Curve D shows the requirement for office buildings and schools. If we have 100 fixture units, for example, the flow requirement for a restaurant is seven gallons per minute, which is a lot more than the 18 gallons per minute required for an elementary school. This makes sense as the water fixtures in the restaurant often are used at the same time. In elementary schools, there are typically many fixtures available, but not many of them would be used at the same time. So now what is a fixture unit? The fixture unit is a concept of, is a concept, a method of calculating the maximum probable water demand within a large building based on the theory of probability. The method is based on assigning a fixture unit, uh, often spelled with an F dash U, uh, value for each type of fixture based on one, the rate of water consumption, Two, the length of time it's normally in use. Three, the average period between successive uses. Keep in mind that a fixture unit is not a flow rate, but a design factor. This is very important. For example, when converting a shower used in an individual dwelling into a fixture unit, we would typically need two fixture units for every shower. We go through the entire building and list that we've made before uh, of the inventory, and we convert all the water fixtures into equivalent fixture units. It should be also kept in mind when calculating the maximum probable water demands, fixture unit values are always added and not the GPM values. For example, if the maximum probable demand for two branches is required and one branch has a load of 1,000 fixture units and the other has 2,000 fixture units, it would be improper to add 208 GPM plus 321 GPM to obtain 529 GPM. So this is actually shown in the chart. Um, the correct procedure is to add 1,000 fixture units and 2,000 fixture units from the, two, from the two branches and obtain the total fixture unit value of 3,000. And then from the table, we determine the correct peak load demand as 432 GPM. This value reflects the proper application of the theory of probability. So don't forget that there are other systems which rely on plumbing pumps for water make for water makeup, service load, etc. Uh, these must be added in after you have determined the fixture load. These include cooling tower, water makeup valve, on-site commercial laundry facilities, such as for hospitals, hotels, dorms, HVAC system makeup load. Boiler water makeup load and any water for swimming pools. So you add these services in addition to the GPM arrived from the charts. <clears throat> 
When designing boosters, there's also a need to take into account any additional codes that may be applicable in the region. The Model University Plumbing Code lists minimum requirements for potable water systems based on the probability theory. There are five model plumbing codes in the United States. The first one is the International Plumbing Code, which is the most widely adopted and it's adopted throughout the United States. Uh, the second is the Uniform Plumbing Code, also called the UPC, and it's adopted mainly in Western US. The third one is the Standard Plumbing Code, the SPC. It's adopted mainly in the Southern US. The Boca Plumbing Code, which is adopted mainly in the Eastern US. And the CABO Plumbing Code, which is exclusively used for residential construction. So after determining the flow, the second step is to determine the boost pressure required. There are five components to calculating the boost pressure required. The first one is the static pressure. The static pressure is determined by the vertical boost required to bring the water to the top floor. So this, com this component doesn't vary. The second component of the boosted pressure is the pressure required to operate critical fixtures at the furthest point from the booster system. Typically, the startup pressure requirement is the limiting factor for this pressure as they require the most pressure to operate. If we look at flush valves, for example, typically their startup pressure required is at least 30 psi to operate. Keep in mind that this pressure doesn't vary and is required as a minimum. The third component of the boost pressure is the pressure across the booster package itself. Booster systems are typically designed to have no more than 5 psi pressure loss from the suction manifold to the discharge manifold. This pressure loss includes all the components in the booster, which may include pumps, isolation and check valves, and header manifolds. In many cases, the pressure loss is included in the manufacturer's booster specifications. But also be aware that this needs to be included in your calculations if not already in the manufacturer's specifications. The fourth component of calculating the boost pressure is determining the suction pressure at the booster. This is the pressure provided by the utility or supply tank, and this typically varies from 20 psi to 50 psi, and can vary quite significantly depending on the region that the booster is located in. This pressure can vary over time as the municipality changes over time due to growth and restructuring. The last component of calculating the boost pressure is determining the friction losses in the system. This includes pressure losses in pipes, elbows, and connections to other equipment. This pressure is typically very small booster com uh, component of the boost pressure, as it is usually calculated at 10 to 15 percent of the total static requirement. This component can be larger in the case of boosting over a campus style area or a large low rise building, so anything with large square footage. So using these pressure components, we can determine the pressure as, boost pressure as uh, a total of the package system losses plus the static head plus the friction head plus the critical fixture pressure minus the suction pressure. The total system pressure is equal to the boost pressure 
plus the suction pressure. So this diagram here shows the different components of the pressure and how they relate to each other. With this information, we have to ensure that our booster package will generate enough boost pressure to meet building demand. And we also have to make sure that our booster package needs to be able to withstand the total system pressure. So going back to our earlier formula, uh, the boost pressure is the required pressure to take um, the water up the building. That's either through static and static and, um, and friction losses. And then there's the extra fixture losses at the top of the floor. And we also have to account for any, any pressure losses from the booster system. And this pressure is provided by partially by the, the city, and the remaining pressure is provided by the booster package itself. So now let's look at a, a modern booster package. Unlike in the past, where individual components needed to be selected and installed on site, modern booster packages are designed such that all components are built at the factory and easily commissioned on site. That means our booster package is a plug and play device. Typical booster packages include uh, pumps, motors, and variable speed drives. So this combination allows us to control the flow um, according to the demand of the building. Keep in mind that in most modern booster packages, all the pumps are identical. So in this diagram, we show a triplex, which is a three pump system, and each pump is identical. Each pump and motor is identical. We also have a control panel, which includes control logic to stage the pumps on and off. So this controls how we, we can, how the pumps move from one pump operating to two pumps operating two pumps operating to three pumps operating, and vice versa. We also have suction and discharge isolation valves, such that we can isolate a single pump if maintenance is required. We also have a check valve, and this prevents any backflow into the pumps. We have uh, pressure gauges, and this allows us to monitor the pressure gate, the pressure. Um, and we also have suction and discharge headers that connect to the building. So in this diagram, we have um, flange connections, but connections are also available in Groove and MPT. And all these components are mounted on a common base right here and it's tested and calibrated to site conditions. Typical booster capability have flows up to 2,000 GPM, boost pressure is up to 450 PSI. The number of pumps can range from one up to six, and voltages from 120 volts up to 575 volts and power up to 50 horsepower per pump. So to be able to generate enough boost pressure, special multi-stage pumps are used. Multi-stage pumps come in both horizontal and vertical configurations, with vertical multi-stage pumps being by far the most commonly used in booster packages. On the left, we have a drawing of a traditional vertical inline pump where the fluid comes in the suction side of the pump. It goes through the impeller where it goes through the impeller where pressure is increased and exits out the discharge. Traditionally, if we wanted more flow, we could place two pumps in, in parallel. And if we wanted more pressure, 
we can put two or more pumps in series. The multi-stage pump uses this principle to increase pressures in a very compact form. First, fluid enters the suction side and goes into the first impeller where pressures are increased. So the, after, after exiting the first impeller, it goes actually into the second impeller where pressure is even further increased. The fluid, the fluid then goes to any additional impellers. And in modern multi-stage pumps, there can be up to 20 impellers stacked together to generate high pressures. When the fluid leaves the last impeller, it goes back down the casing and goes out the discharge. Traditionally, you know, the challenge to size boosters, as we need to know how many pumps, uh, pump horsepower, number of stages, and look metic meticulously at pump curves to be able to select a booster. With modern software, it's very simple to size a booster package. As you can see from the screenshot of the selection software, all the booster performance envelopes are included. By simply entering flow, boost pressure, and suction pressure, as we determined previously, we are given all our possible selections. We can see that a single duty point, there are multiple overlapping booster envelopes that can satisfy the requirement. If there's not a selection available, keep in mind that manufacturers will typically produce envelopes for commonly used boosters. Special configurations can be made for your application if required. So on this slide, we have the outputs from our selection. We can see that we're given four different options. The first option is a booster comprised of three pumps, and the other three options are boosters comprised of four pumps. To complete our selection, we need to determine how many pumps we'd like to use and if there's any redundancy required. In most cases, the least number of pumps and smaller horsepower motors would equate to lower costs. With respect to redundancy, in the past, 100% redundancy was used. Modern boosters typically now use M plus one redundancy, where the active duty pumps would have the same specifications and an additional pump would be included for redundancy. Presently, there's a trend to think of redundancy in a different way. Thinking about pumps or pump curves, if there's any extra capacity available in addition to the full duty requirements, there's a chance that the additional pump is not required as the capacity of the duty pumps can provide sufficient flow and head in case one pump fails. So after <clears throat> selecting our booster, uh, we get typical outputs. Uh, the first one includes a detailed submittal. Um, so this would typically be in a AI, AI, AIA format. Um, then we have uh, ROI calculations. So ROI means return on investment. This one's actually quite important as um, return on investment calculations can get you significant rebates in certain regions. And these rebates are provided by either the government uh, or the utility. Uh, because variable speed boosters save a significant amount of money, uh, a significant amount of energy compared to constant speed boosters, uh, there's potential for a very large rebate. Another typical output is drawings, uh, with also specifications and Revit models that be, can be included in your building models. So in addition to booster, another important consideration is hydropneumatic tanks, which is our drawdown tank. The purpose of the, of the drawdown tank 
is to hold additional pressurized water to maintain pressure in the piping system and supply small demands to allow pumps be, to be shut down. This way, if a toilet is flushed at 2 a.m. in the morning, the booster package doesn't have to come on immediately to satisfy the system requirements. Typically, hydropneumatic tanks are bladder type and are placed at the top of the building to minimize the size of the required tank. However, tanks can be of different types and placed at other strategic places around the building. A properly sized hydropneumatic tank is required to prevent short cycling of the booster system and is recommended with every booster package installation. If the tank is too small, the booster system will short cycle and create reliability issues. Most modern tanks are fitted with a bladder where water enters the bladder, filling up the space in the tank and compressing the air surrounding the bladder. The compressed air creates a cushion that can absorb or apply pressure as needed to provide efficient water supply under low demand conditions without operating the pump. Bladders are usually made with NSF rated materials because of potable requirements. If we monitor a booster system, we notice that throughout the day, the demand of the booster changes quite drastically. Typically, water demand would peak in the morning, evening, and midnight hours, with water demand staying low for the remainder of the day. The fact is that HVAC and plumbing is dominated by part loads. In the past, we had sized equipment to full loads but this would inevitably lead to oversized equipment and poor efficiencies as equipment would only load fully a fraction of the time. The industry is slowly shifting towards solutions that take advantage of the part load phenomena and the incredible energy savings available. We can strategically select boosters in a certain way to take advantage of the part load conditions. The pump curve on the left shows a selection uses using the traditional method. The curve on the right shows a selection using modern methods. In the past, we traditionally select a booster with full load duty to the left of the best efficiency curve. This way, we maximize the full load efficiencies. But as you can see, during average loads, the equipment, the equipment will perform poorly. So in this uh, case, we have the average load is uh, 68%, while the design point is 72%. Currently, there's a trend to select a booster pump with a full load, load duty point to the right of the best efficiency curve when possible. The curve on the right shows that even though uh, full load efficiency is less at 68%, the average load is 74%, leading to considerable energy savings. So another consideration is ASHRAE 90.1. Um, ASHRAE 90.1 is the energy standard for buildings which the Energy Policy Act, or EPA, requires all states to have energy codes substantially equal to the latest approved version. The goal of ASHRAE Standard 90.1-2010 was to achieve a 30% energy cost savings compared to 90.1-2004. Standard 90.1-2010 simply 90.1-2007 with the incorporation of more than 100 approved addenda, 50 of, 52 of which affect mechanical systems. So why should you comply with ASHRAE 90.1 standard? Uh, it's first required for LEED certification. It will help you attain a prerequisite level for the building. 
It's required for all federal facilities. It saves energy, and it's an easy way to mandate energy efficient designs. Battery Standard 98.1-2010 includes boosters for the first time from an energy saving perspective. And the booster section is in section 10.4.2. Section 10.4.2 includes three main points, A, B, and C. So part A, traditionally all boosters come with one sensor at the suction side and one sensor at the discharge side of the booster package. This change calls for feedback control by placing the sensor at the critical fixture at the top of the building. This arrangement factors that the actual friction losses rather than the hypothetical calculated one. So ASHRAE acknowledges that it's not always feasible to run wires to, to place the pressure sensor at the critical fixture at the top of the building, as there's a cost associated with running conduits and wires. This clause also allows logic in the software to simulate the change in friction losses as, ch as the flow changes. We call this feature of changing the set point of the flow to cater to varying friction losses as pressure setback. And this is a, a very common uh, feature in booster packages. So section 10.4.2b states that service water <coughs> pressure booster systems must be designed such that no device or devices shall be installed for the purpose of reducing pressure of all the water supplied by any booster system pump or booster system except for safety devices. This effectively bans the use of pressure reducing valves or PRVs on boosters, with the exception of safety valves installs, installed for the purpose of keeping discharge pressures below 80 psi. In other words, you cannot constrict pump flow to keep downstream pressure at a predetermined limit. This requirement will transition nearly every booster system to variable speed and lead to the eventual disappearance of constant speed booster systems. It's worth noting that the scope of this banning is only for PRVs installed on booster packages. PRVs used on different floors and as part of the plumbing system of the building for regulating pressure on different floors remain unchanged. <clears throat> so, the most energy efficient pump is a pump that isn't on, which is why standard 90.1-2010 prohibits the operation of booster system pumps when there's no service water flow. Ascertaining that booster pumps only operate when there's a call for domestic water without short cycling means two things. One, an, effect, an effective demand-based sensing control must be in place. So this feature, uh, an effective demand-based sensing control uh, is often called a no-flow shutdown feature. Second, the system must be adequately, supplied, adequately pressurized during low demand periods to meet minor intermittent demands, such as the occasional 3 a.m. toilet flush or glass of water. Addressing the later prerequisite first, a properly uh, sized hydro pneumatic tank is required to prevent short cycling of the booster system. Hydro pneumatic tanks are ASME and non ASME vessels that hold water and air under pressure. The compressed air creates a cushion that absorbs or applies pressure as needed to provide efficient water supply under low demand conditions without the operation of pumps. These tanks should be sized based on the length of time the designer theorizes that the booster pump should remain inoperable in the no-flow condition. The type of building application and the location of the tank in relation to the pressure booster pumps. It's important to remember that if the tank is too small, the booster system will short cycle, which, which 
wastes energy and shortens the equipment life. It is, it is a misnomer that variable speed booster systems can operate effectively without a hydropneumatic tank, as invariably, short cycling will occur without the use of low cost pressurization strategy in place. Boosters are, in most cases, responsible for pumping potable water. So NSF standards is a, variable, is a very important consideration. There are two types of NSF standards relating to boosters. NSF 61, which deals with toxicity of materials, and NSF 372, or um, NSF 61G, which is equivalent, limits the lead content to less than 0.25%. As of January 2014, NSF 372 is a requirement as the low lead law was imposed across the United States. NSF 61 is a requirement only in certain states. According to NSF standards, manufacturers will test their products for compliance and certification will be issued for the exact model number of the manufacturer as a complete system. Certification for compliance to NSF 61 and 372 can be done directly through the NSF organization or through any independent lab that tests according to NSF standards. We're able to check the successful listing of a specific product model by looking it up at the lab website. So the pictures here, they're actually taken from um, NSF. So you can go to nsf.org to check out specific manufacturing listings. Be aware that some manufacturers have their complete system NSF certified, while some other manufacturers only use NSF certified pumps. This can cause problems with local inspectors. Last, lastly, when considering booster packages, we need to be aware that these are plug-and-play devices with many built-in features. Some of the important features to consider when choosing a booster include, one, pump sequencing. So for booster packages, packages with multiple pumps, how do you know when to turn on the second, third, and last pump. One way is to run the first pump to full speed and then turn on an additional pump if the duty requirements are not met. This is called speed-based alternation. A second method runs the first pump until the efficiency of the two pumps are better than one. This saves energy and is called efficiency-based alternation. The second feature is pump alternation. Booster sets are typically running at low flows for the most of the day. For booster packages with multiple pumps, this would mean one pump would be operating most of the time. The pump alternation feature keeps a record of the pump's run time and cycles the duty pump such that the run time for every pump is similar. This evens out the pump wear and extends the life of the system. The third feature is soft fill. This feature, so pumps operate, uh, allows pumps to operate gradually, uh, filling up pipes at system startup or maintenance. So if we fill the pipes too fast, we can, we can um, create water hammers or over, over pressurization. By filling the pumps, uh, the pipe slowly, uh, we prevent these problems. The fourth feature is smooth pump starting and sequencing. When changing from running one pump to two pumps, we need to ensure that the first pump ramps down slowly and the second pump ramps up slowly and harmoniously so that sudden spikes in pressure or vibration is not present. 
The last feature is out of duty range protection. This feature protects the pump in case of operating out of range, and this prevents overamping. So, to recap, the, the design process is as follows. First, we need to determine the flow, and this is uh, found by first figuring out the application, the number of fixtures, and the fixture types. Second, we need to determine the boost pressure. And this is figured out by taking the different components of the boost pressure calculation. And third, we need to determine the required suction pressure and total pressure. We use this information from steps one to three to select our booster. Once our booster is selected, we need to consider other factors, uh, such as NSF 61, NSF 372. We also have to consider ASHRAE 90.1 and any booster features. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, is there any questions? Yeah, some questions came over via the chat feature, uh, Redmond. Yeah. Um, let's start with one. He says, uh, when does ASHRAE 90.1 take effect in regards to pressure reducing valves on the booster pump, or has it already taken effect? Uh, yeah, so so it depends on, it depends on the state. Um, so at, there, there's, uh, there's, I mentioned earlier that there's ASHRAE 90.1-2010, 2007, and 2004. So uh, if, you, if you look at a map of the United States, it depends on the specific region. Um, because in some regions they'll they'll use higher higher standards, uh, so they'll be implementing ASHRAE 2010. But there's also also other um, states that use lower standards, um, and you'll see that there's some states that use ASHRAE uh, 90.1-2004. So it depends on the location uh, and and your region. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question came over. Uh, how do you size a hydro pneumatic tank? So, sizing a hydro uh, uh, expansion tank is a uh, is a little it's it's complex. Uh, so we didn't include it in this presentation, uh, but there are, there are documents that, that that show you exactly how to size it. Um, so basically, as a designer, you have to first figure out uh, what's your leakage rates. So um, and then this depends on the facility that you're designing for. So it depends uh, in a very if it's a hospital, if it's a, a school, uh, so it depends. Your leakage rate will depend on the, the, the different type of um, buildings, and you have to consider uh, the your leakage rates, and you also have to consider how long um, you want your booster to stay off during uh, during during no flow shutdown. Uh, so you have to consider all these. It's 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 well documented, and I can I can share uh, with you. Some training material afterwards, if required. Okay. Okay. Um, some some more questions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, where can you get the booster pump sizing software that you show? Uh, the boosting pump sizing software that, that's uh, specifically for our company, uh, so Armstrong Pumps. But it's 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 actually available online. Um, so I can send you a link to that also if you wanna if you wanna use that. Um, so it's it's quite simple to use and uh, it's very easy to size a, a booster package. Okay. And um, looks like another one here. Um, are remote pressure transducers required on the upper floors? So on most booster packages, um, th there is a, there is an option to have remote pressure transducers. Uh, but according to ASHRAE 90.1, it's not it's not uh, it's not required. So uh, a lot of manufacturers use instead uh, the pressure setback uh, feature, what I talked about earlier. So basically, what happens is you install the booster, and then you take pressure uh, measurements at the top of floor to calibrate your booster. So once your booster is calibrated, it can use software to simulate your control curves. Uh, so this way, you don't need to um, run wires or conduits all the way up to the top floor. 
Um, and this is what most manufacturers uh, are, are using right now. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I think that covers the questions. Um, so thanks, Redman, for the excellent presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, hope you liked the class. Uh, later this afternoon, I'll be sending out your ASPE CEUs uh, via email. Um, if you don't see it from me, just give me a call or shoot me an email. Maybe I missed you. No big deal. I'll get it right to you. Uh, also, look for a recording of today's class on our YouTube channel. Um, and, yeah, please join us for our next class. It's actually going to be a hands-on Disney McLean University class in our, our new wet lab. It's going to be covering a pretty hot topic, uh, digital mixing valves. We have a digital mixing valve installed in our wet lab that we'd like to demonstrate for you. And, of course, um, lunch will be provided. So, yeah, it's going to be on uh, November 14th. Uh, presented by Jason Plagman with Disney McLean and Associates. Um, yeah, and uh, sorry, one more question came over. Um, oh yeah, no, we can definitely. A question came: Can you uh, email hydro pneumatic tank training information to the group after the meeting? Which we certainly can. Um, Redmond, if you don't mind, forward me the information, and I'll send it out to those requesting it, or maybe just the whole group. Um, sure, no, no problem. Yeah, yeah, so that's kind of wraps it up, guys. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and hope to see you next time. Okay, thanks, guys.